In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, one God, Amen. My beloved, today is January 15th, 2020. Wishing all of you a very, very happy new year. I pray that everyone had a chance to be able to take the blessings of the Feast of Nativity, which we celebrated in the Coptic Orthodox Rite uh, just last week on January 7th, on the 29th of Kiak. Uh, and just this Sunday, upcoming Sunday, we will be celebrating together the Feast of Theophany where the Lord is baptized for all of our sakes and receives the Holy Spirit for all of us. Wishing all of you a very, very, very blessed uh, festive period. Today, actually, the church celebrated the circumcision of our Lord God and Savior Jesus Christ, which is a very, actually, a very unique feast that we celebrate in the Coptic Orthodox Church. We're one of the only churches who actually celebrates this. And this just goes to show to what point we really believe in the Incarnation. We really believe in what the church calls the Theantropos, the God-man, the God who became man for our sakes, right? And there is nothing more human than for a young male child to be circumcised. And all of these things, I want to wish all of you a very happy festive period, a very happy new year, wishing all of you to be very blessed um, this year. May the Lord shower you with all of his blessings and his graces. Now, as you know, we're back at it in 2020. We're going to be doing our live Q&As. Today, we're going to begin and kick off the year with our first Q&A. We've received many questions over the last little period. We're going to continue doing our weekly videos, trying to answer many of the questions that you have submitted. Father Gabriel is going to be doing his deep dive in the Gospel of St. John. We will be sharing with you so many of the beautiful gems in these little clips of these words of wisdom videos that we share of many different Orthodox speakers out there. Uh, and if you take a look at the descriptions, we always share the first, the, 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 the full sermon. So by all means, please open the descriptions and don't only listen to the two or three minutes that we shared, but listen to the entire sermon. They're very, very edifying. So my beloved, without further ado, we welcome everybody who has joined. By all means, if anybody has any questions that they want to share live, they can go ahead and do so. And in the process, we'll see them come up and we'll try to answer them as we go. In the meantime, to kick things off and to make sure that people have a chance to be able to warm up until someone breaks the ice, uh, we are going to be answering a question that was submitted to us uh, by many of you guys as our viewers and the people who pray for us and support us. So let me begin with the first question that was asked, and it's a question that is asked by many people, especially our young people who are still trying to understand the mystery of prayer. Now the prayer says, if God knows all things, even those things that we need and will pray for, then what's the point of prayer? Very good question. And, and it's a question that is, it's very logical. Why is it that if I truly believe that God knows all things, and why would I pray? So let's begin with a few things. Um, there's a premise here, or there's an understanding that underlines this question that I think is very false. And that understanding is that I think people might approach prayer as if this is our way of informing God of something. Now, my beloved, we have to be very clear. We do not speak to God or communicate with God through prayer in order to inform him of something. It's not like I'm coming to him and telling him, Lord, I didn't uh, pass my interview or I didn't get the job or I didn't end up um, purchasing that house or, you know, this person turned me down. I got rejected in this. I'm not informing him and God is in heaven going, really? Did that, did that happen? I wasn't aware. Thank you for telling me. We're not informing God of anything when we are praying. On the contrary, we should be really asking the question, who is it that benefits from prayer? Because God forbid that we should have the impression that when I pray more, God increases, or when I don't pray, God somehow decreases. The Lord does not fluctuate in His, gro in his glory or in His majesty, in His splendor, if I pray or if I don't pray. God is constant. We really believe that He is completely unchangeable which means that he does not receive additional glory because I choose to pray, and he does not lessen in glory or lose any power because his people do not speak to him. Which tells me that God is not the one who benefits from our prayers, however. The person who benefits the most from prayer, from communication with God, from this relationship with the Almighty, is me. Which tells me that everything that I do in prayer is for me. Now you have to understand this, while it is a relationship between me and God, which means that there is a dialogue that happens there, not just a monologue. The number one person who benefits is myself, which tells you and me immediately that the reason we pray is not to inform God, nor to increase His splendor in any which way, 
but rather this is me coming to God because I need to build this relationship through communication. I want to give you a very silly example, but I hope that this example gives you an idea. It is not because God knows something that that somehow translates into I don't need to tell him. No. Sometimes as his child, I need to be able to express how much I need him, how much I want his grace, his mercy, his compassion, how much I am frustrated, how I am suffering, how there is so many things happening in my life that are tearing me down, that I feel a sense of hopelessness. When I express these things to the person that I know who loves me, that I am in a relationship with him, what happens there is that I am comforted. I am the one who receives grace. I am the one who is blessed in the process. And the Lord wants me to participate in that. So that when I bring myself into His presence, I receive from Him. So it's not a matter of exchange of information. It's about relationship. The example I want to give you is the following. Imagine, if you wish, that I'm sitting in my living room. Now, my living room happens to be very close to my kitchen. Like there's, there, there's, It's not very far. We're talking about just a few feet distance. So when I'm sitting in the living room and I'm reading a book or I'm sitting there and scrolling on something on the internet or wherever that may be, and let's say both of my kids are in the kitchen with my wife, Tina, and they're baking muffins and I can hear them. You can hear them cracking the eggs. You can hear them moving things around and there's clamor and there's clinking and clanging and there, you can hear Tina giving them instructions. Okay, now put in the flour, now put in the milk, now add the chocolate chips. And they're doing all of these things. I can hear what's going on inside there even though I'm not with them in the room. Now, let's say, for instance, uh, once they're done and they put it in the oven, my daughter comes running to me and she goes, Daddy, 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 guess what we're doing? Now, as a good father, what should be my reaction? Should I sit there and educate Maria as to how it is that, no, Daddy is not so far away. I heard everything. I'm already aware you're making muffins. I know you put chocolate chips. I, you don't have to tell me. You don't have to tell me. You don't have to inform me. Daddy is already aware. I wouldn't do that. I wouldn't cut her off and stop her from sharing with me what she's excited to share with me. On the contrary, I would sit there and I would tell her, what is it, sweetie? What do you want to tell me? And I really do believe that it is in allowing her to express this excitement of telling me we're making muffins or we put chocolate chips and I'm the one who cracked the eggs and I'm the one who mixed it all together. In the process of allowing her to do this, I'm building her up. And not only am I building her up, I'm connecting with her in a way that she needs me to connect with her. Now, it's not because I was already aware. It's not because I already heard everything that's happening in the kitchen, that that somehow translates into me now telling her there is no point in you saying anything. And on the contrary, I wouldn't want Maria to ever reach the point where she stops communicating with me because she maybe realizes that I might know something. I want her to speak to me. And if this is what a, a physical, biological, weak human fatherly reaction is, Imagine how the unconditional love of God the Father is when we approach Him in prayer. I want you to know that the same thing applies when we're going through pain or suffering. If my son, for instance, that day, he happens to be riding his bicycle and he, 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 something happens, he falls off the bike, he scrapes his knee, he hurt himself really bad and he's feeling that kind of pain and he's not happy about what happened. And my wife happened to message me throughout the day just to let me know, hey, Mikey fell off his bike. When these things happen, if I walk in and, and Michael wants to tell me about his pain, he wants to tell me about step by step what happened and how shocking it was for him and how difficult it was for him. And he wants to tell me this because he also wants to see my reaction. He wants to know that I can have that level of compassion of asking about him, caring for him, maybe kissing him where it hurts or saying a small prayer with him, asking God to be able to heal him. I don't stop him and say, you don't have to tell me anything. I'm already aware your mother already informed me. Because it's not about the passing on of information. It's about the relationship. It's about communication. It's about building that person up and allowing them to express themselves. And so there's so much more to prayer going on than simply this idea of if God already knows, what's the point? Well, there's so much happening in prayer. It's not just the exchange of information. You're not speaking to God so you can inform him or keep him up to date or maybe telling him something he didn't know. You're telling him because you as his child need to come into his presence. You're praying because it's important for you to be able to express that. And there are many things that we need to externalize from ourselves in order to be liberated from them in prayer. Not to mention the fact that when I bring myself into his presence, this is where I feel his grace. This is where I receive his blessing. This is where... The comfort of it, the warmth of, of, of the Lord's embrace is so present and accessible to me. And so don't think for a moment, my beloved, that just because God happens to know something, because in his foreknowledge, 
and in his omnipotence and his uh, him being Pantocrator and knowing all things and being almighty that this somehow translates into it's pointless it's useless no we are called to relationship with God we are not simply called to follow things mechanically you're not praying so you can inform him you're praying because you want to be in his presence and this is why the church really does believe that one of the greatest forms of prayer is silence or we come and sit in his presence and say it is enough lord that i sit here before you and that in and of itself can very well be prayer and that's a subject for a different day but at the very least i hope that answered the question of the person who submitted it god bless you guys uh, there is a question that has come in from Marmila. Hi, Abuna. Uh, can we talk about the beautification of relics? Where does this tradition originate from? What, uh, who does it, when, how, and why? Thank you and happy feast. The most blessed feast to you too, Radmila. So very, very good question. As far as um, where does the tradition originate from, this is a very, very good question. Now, Unfortunately, I don't have exact dates to be able to share with you, and I wish I could research it a little bit more instead of me just giving you a random answer. I definitely know that it is something that goes all the way back to the very early centuries of Christianity, where immediately we began to see martyrs, and the believers would take those uh, the bodies of those saints, and they would treat them with an extreme amount of uh, veneration. Now, you'll even see this in the Synexarium or the hagiographies where basically the lives of the saints were in the very early churches, even as early as, for instance, the early church bishops who were uh, killed in the emporiums or, or, or crucified or the apostles themselves who were killed in front of all of the believers. All of those relics were taken and honored and venerated by the church. Now, at what point do we begin beautifying them or adding to them the oils and the spices and the scents and, and honoring them in that way? Now, this is a very Jewish tradition. And you'll notice that this is exactly what it is that the women went to go do at the tomb of Christ when they went to go see him after his burial. They wanted to be able to honor him in that way. Now, we continue to do this in the church and it's typically done by the clergy members. So it can be done by the bishops, by the priests and with the aid of the deacons, what we are doing there is that we are taking, you'll notice in the, in, the, in the Coptic Orthodox Church, what we have at the very least, is that you'll have a very small portion of the relics. And don't be fooled, my beloved. Sometimes we have these big boxes that are put on display for people to take the blessing, where in reality, you probably have a very, very small relic within it. Uh, and, and that box there that contains the relics of the saints, what we do is that during typically the days of their feasts, so for instance, we have St. Anthony's feast that's going to be coming up. Actually, that's not a very good example because we don't know where the body of St. Anthony is. According to the biography of, uh, of St. Athanasius, what it is that he wrote about St. Anthony, the Lord hid his body as per his request. Uh, but regardless of whose saint it is, let's say, for instance, it's St. Moses the Strong. So St. Moses, his feast is in July, on July 1st. So the church will come together at Vespers or during that liturgy on July 1st. And what we will do is that we will, while the, the, the deacons and the psalters and the entire congregation are chanting together the doxologies, what we will do is that we will begin to take these precious oils and these beautiful scents and perfumes, and we will take this very specific, I, I don't even know its name in English. Um, we call them hanout. It's basically a powder that is, has a beautiful aroma. We mix it in with the rest of the oils, and we beautify the relics. And this is a way for us to be able to honor and venerate them. And again, it's a matter of the same way that you would want to honor and show respect to a person who is coming to you on the day of a feast. When we receive the Pope, we offer uh, the best that we have. When we receive uh, our father, the bishop, we do that same thing. Or even when you receive family members from out of town, there is this idea of wanting to offer them the best that you have. And so on the days of the feasts, we venerate and glorify these saints who in their bodies, in their human nature, while they were still with us here on earth, they made their temples into truly holy temples that the Holy Spirit used for the sake of glorifying God. And they, because they have lived these lives that are righteous, we venerate them. And this tells you something about the Orthodox belief. It tells you something about how it is that we don't believe the body to be evil. Unlike many other faiths out there, or even the Gnostics of the early, uh, the, the, the heretics of the, that we found in the early church, and we still find traces of this in a lot of people's theology, we do not believe the body to be evil. As a matter of fact, if the body was evil, we could not believe in an incarnate Lord. But because the body 
was meant to be a vessel that the Holy Spirit can dwell in. And because through the incarnation, everything has been redeemed, including our physical bodies, then we honor them. And so we honor the saints through the relics that they have left behind. Now, we don't believe, for instance, if we have the relics of St. Mark or the relics of St. Damien or the relics of any of the saints, we don't believe that somehow the person of the saint is confined to that box. We don't believe that. But we do honor their bodies in the same way that we recognize that in their human form while they were with us here, they utilize these temples of the Holy Spirit to bring glory to God and to also inspire and edify all those around them. So, Admila, I hope that answers your questions just a little bit uh, in regards to why we do what we do and who is the one who does it. We have a question from Bintu that says, Dear Abuna, could you take a class for youth Syriac Orthodox believers? Could you take a class? Uh, Bintu, please feel free to message me privately if I'm not sure I'm completely understanding the, the, um, the request. I'm not sure if this is a request or a question. Uh, but if, if this is a request, please message me and I'd be happy to see how it is I can help. God bless you. Um, Nat Nayel asks a question and says, Hello, Abuna. I would like to ask you about the Orthodox view on the original sin and failure of nature. Very good question, Nat Nayel. Now, the, the whole topic of original sin or what many of the, the, the Eastern Rite Christians, especially the Orthodox, uh, some people call the ancestral sin. Bottom line is that there are different views and sometimes it gets very complicated. Ultimately, what we believe as Orthodox Christians is what we read very specifically in the liturgical prayers of baptism. Now, what are we saying here? What we are discovering is that humanity, when it stepped away from God, there's three crucial things that happened there. We were created incorrupt and we fell into corruption. We were created to know God and in the process we were alienated from Him. And we were created to be alive, and in the process, we embraced death. Now, these are the three most basic understandings of what happened in the fall. We were alienated from God. In the process, we have chosen death, and we have entered into corruption. Human nature did not suddenly change overnight. We weren't something else, and now we are human. But if you wish, the fathers sometimes speak of this idea of how it is that human nature was now found broken or ill. Something happened within the human being that made it not be what it was intended to be. Now, this happened in what we call the event of the fall. Now, the event, when we say this, we're not talking about a specific time period. It could have very well been a very lengthy process. We don't know, have all of the details in regards to what led to the fall. But according to Scripture, it describes it in that moment, that moment where both Adam and Eve, where first Eve chose to listen to the serpent and fell and then took and offered to her husband, and then he also ate. That entire scenario is what we typically call the fall. Now, what we inherited from Adam and Eve, and St. Cyril of Alexandria makes this very clear. He talks about how it is that we, did not, we, we will not be judged for Adam's guilt. Adam will be told, why did you eat? I will not be asked, why did you eat? I'm not the one who ate. Adam is the one who ate. And so in that sense, I did not inherit the guilt of that very specific action. But what did I take from my father, Adam? All of humanity now being born of Adam and Eve, what we have inherited here is corrupted nature. And so if Adam contracted the illness of sin, if you wish, and this is a very common language in the church fathers, if we have contracted the disease of sin or the death of sin, now that my forefather, where I find my trace back to him, he has this illness of sin. He has this brokenness. He has this corruptedness. He has removed God from the equation. When I come into being, I inherit that also. So what do we believe actually happens in baptism? We talk about this idea of putting off the old man and putting on the new man. This death in Christ through the baptismal font, that when I am immersed in the water three times, I die with Christ and I rise again with Christ. And so what Christ came to do was to take on humanity and all of its brokenness, all of its brokenness, except for sin alone. And this is very clear from St. Paul. that He says in the book of Hebrews that we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our, with our weakness, but was in all things tempted as we are, yet without sin. He took on everything that we are, everything. 
So we were never meant to be able to reach this point of corruptedness, to deal with illness, to deal with so much suffering, to be surrounded in a world that is so evil and debased. But yet these are all the effects of the fall. And so human nature has inherited this brokenness. What we aim to do in the Christian life, first beginning with the baptism and then the chrismation and the reception of the Holy Spirit, and then participation in the Eucharist and participation in confession and repentance, and this constant renewal, this working hand in hand, this synergy between me and God, is that so I can constantly renew myself, constantly be what God created me to be when He created me in His image and His likeness. So, Natnael, what you're asking is a very loaded question. How much of all of this is the dogma of original sin? Is it possible that we took on more than just the corruption? Those are discussions that I will leave for the theologians. What is 100% clear in the teachings of the church, both in the church fathers as well as the liturgical rites, is that part of the incarnation and the theophany that we're going to celebrate next Sunday, and also the, 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 the baptism that we received in its chrismation, is that God does not want us to be in this corrupted state. He wants to renew humanity. And so this renewal is to be able to allow us to get rid of what it is that we have inherited through the mortal actions or, or through the sinful actions of our forefathers, Adam and Eve, in order for us to be able to live again, to be new in Christ. Now, now I'm sorry if that doesn't go into too much detail or as much detail as you want. Obviously, as you know, this is a very debated question. And at the end of the day, what is very clear is that Christ has given us the tools to be able to eliminate from ourselves this corruption that we have inherited in order for us to become new creations in Him. Elvin asks the following question. God bless you, my friend. Uh, we see examples of King Jezekiah whose life was extended by God when he prayed. And in the marriage of Cana, God knows already what he is about to do. However, he says, my time hasn't come. Is it that God changed his decision or is this a mystery? It's very much a mystery, Alvin. Very, very much a mystery. You see, when we're, when we're talking about God in Scripture and we use language, we have to understand the limitation is never found in God. The limitation is found in our expression, in our language. It's very interesting because um, St. John Chrysostom, he talks about how it is that even the greatest of theologians who, who speak in the most theological terminologies, who talks about how it is that they can be extremely sophisticated and articulate, that no matter how much we express to God, that our high theology is nothing more than a baby's babble, he says. That God looks down on us in our limited method of communication, and he speaks to us as if we're children. You know how when we look at children, we adopt the same language as them, and we, we, we go, oh, goo goo, gra, gra, booty, booty, and we do all of these funny noises, and we adopt the same language, the same language, if you wish. As the child, God speaks to us at that level. There is no way that the limitation of our language and our expression could ever fully encompass the mystery of all that God is. And sometimes we're forced to use language such as this, my time has not yet come. You know, you'll find the same thing very similarly in the book of Genesis chapter 6, where the author of the book, who we traditionally say is Moses, when he writes in chapter 6 about what God sees happening in humanity and how the, the evil thought and intention of the mind and of the heart is continuously evil at all times, that when God sees this, that he uses the words, and God regretted that he had created humanity, right? And now here the word regretted, how are we to understand it? In the English language, it seems very clear. Regret means, oh, I think I made a mistake. But God forbid that we should ever appropriate to God that kind of behavior. God is not sitting there in heaven and saying, I think I made a mistake. I think I messed up. I shouldn't have created them. Maybe this is not as good as I thought it would be. That is not the kind of behavior or thought or ideology we would find in God who is perfect and omni, um, uh, omniscient and knows all things this is, this can't, those two things can't coexist. The limitation is never found in God. The limitation is always found in our expression and use of language. And so to find out what this actually means, this is where we would typically turn to the early church commentaries. So if you have access to the writings of the early church, specifically the commentaries of the fathers, if you have access to many of the apps that are available today, like a wonderful app, uh, app called Katena, if you have a chance to look it up, it's a wonderful tool that was actually created by uh, a lot of our young men and women who serve within the Orthodox community. Beautiful, beautiful tool, and God bless them for their efforts, where you simply choose the chapter, choose the verse, and it tells you 
what um, what commentary they have found for those very specific verses. And it's verse by verse. It's really beautifully done. If not, there's other Christian commentaries that you can look up to see what it is that was meant. And in studying the mind of the early church and the church fathers, you'll have a better idea of what it is that was said there. Now, forgive me. I'm not well versed enough on that passage to be able to answer that very specific question. But in general, what I would tell you, Alvin, is that again, when we see these things, we have to understand that there is a mystery there. There is something that needs to be unpacked because God forbid that the limitation of our language should be then be projected on the person of God, the Holy Trinity, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. And because we are limited, we limit them because of our limited access to expression and language. I hope that answers Alvin. Simona has the following question. Hi, Abuna. How can we cope with judgments and criticisms that come from people? Or what should be our perception of this as a Christian way? Very good question, Simona. And unfortunately, you're describing something that is um, very often lived by many within the Christian community. And unfortunately, the criticisms and the judgments that we receive are from our brothers and sisters, people that we hold to high esteem, people that we would hope would not feel or speak to us in those ways. But yet, this is what we are dealing with, right? In the human frailty, we judge each other. And I want to tell you there's a few things that I think that we can do. At the pastoral level, first and foremost, we got to remember, we have to remember, the commandment of the Lord that talks about this whole idea of how it is that we should not judge lest we be judged, right? We also have to remember that what we pray in the prayer of our Father when we talk about how it is and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who have trespassed against us. When I remember the commandments and the words of Scripture, when I remember what it is that the Lord has given to me, what I see there is that I am called to first and foremost realize I have also judged, I have also criticized others, I have also fallen short of being merciful or, uh, or, or showing a certain sense of respect to all of my brothers and sisters. And so in the process, I am fully familiar with how it is that I have my own failings. I have crossed those lines. Now, it is not because I haven't judged that specific person that somehow that means that I'm, I should be saying, but why would they do that to me? I'm fully aware of what it's like to judge another person. And so being reminded of that, I don't want to fall into the sin of judgment or resentment or anger towards that other person. I have to recognize who it is that I should be angry towards. And this is something that my spiritual father encourages me to do. Always see the work of the evil one behind your brother's failings. When I look at my brother who has failed to love me, to respect me, who has judged me, who is angry towards me, who has defamed me, who has done all of these things to me, my anger should not be aroused towards my brother. I should aim it towards the evil one who is moving my brother towards sin. That on the contrary, I should look at my brother and pray for him, that the Lord would rescue him from this temptation. That I would pray that his heart would be touched and that he would be receiving grace in order for him to be able to repent from this. And so in the process, I direct my anger towards what is truly worthy of anger. And that is towards him who is the enemy of all of humanity who makes me fall constantly. And if I remember my own failings, I will be able to combat that feeling of criticism and that, that, that ill feeling of uh, disappointment or resentment that might stir up within me when my brother criticizes or judges me. And obviously the quicker that I can forgive, the more grace I am capable of receiving. In the end, I think the greatest practices we can have is to always ask the question, despite the fact that it hurt me, despite the fact that it was unwarranted, is there truth in the criticism? And I have to tell you that sometimes we're often tempted to believe that because the way something was said was so, uh, was so violent, was so aggressive, was so disrespectful, that I am more hurt about the method of the communication and don't realize that there is truth in what was actually said. So for instance, if my son decides that when I'm correcting him, he suddenly tells me, but you do that all the time also. Well, I don't appreciate his tone. I don't. I really wish that my son wouldn't speak to me that way, right? But is there truth in what my son is saying? Is it true that I also do that? Is there an opportunity for me to be able to take a step back and to reassess and to realize that maybe there is an opportunity for repentance for me? This is the greatest and most, I think, the wisest of actions that we can do. And it's sometimes very difficult. And I'm not going to sit here and tell you that it's very easy. On the contrary, it requires a tremendous amount of humility. It also requires a tremendous amount of discernment. But if I can identify if there is truth in that criticism, 
then I should take it seriously regardless of how it was said to me. And if there is no truth found to be in it, if I'm simply accused of something that is a lie, then this is where I turn to God and I pray for both my brother and for myself. The Lord would grant us both grace to be able to overcome this temptation. Simone, I hope that helps in any sort of way, my dear. Michael asked the following question. Hey, Abuna, uh, I'm not sure how to phrase this, but I have been praying and asking God to show me what he wants me to do in a certain situation. I have been praying, asking my father of confession, and I tried my best at comparing both outcomes, but I want to know what God wants me to do, but I am not sure how. Uh, I have been asking God to show me his way, but what do I do when I still don't feel an answer? Well, Michael Habibi, what you're describing is, uh, is very common for people who are looking for God's will. And I want you to know that depending on what the situation is, sometimes, you know, when God answers us, his answers are, are one of three things. Pope Shenouda used to say this all the time, and I love it, and so I repeat it all the time. This whole idea of um, God either says yes, no, or not now. So the real question is, which of these do you and your father of confession and all those that you have involved in praying for you, which of these is everyone feeling? Now, I got to be honest with you and tell you that sometimes God's answer is, I'm okay with whatever you choose, I'm going to bless. Because the options are not always one is good and one is bad. We oftentimes have this very dramatic approach of thinking, what will lead to my salvation and one will lead to hellfire. It's not always like that. When a person is applying between uh, to schools and he's applying between becoming, I don't know, uh, he either the person is applying into nursing or the person is applying into teaching. Both are very good. Both are very different. And obviously, here God is not going to sit there and say, well, if you choose teaching, it, this is going to lead to your damnation. And if you go into nursing, you will become a saint. I don't think it's as dramatic as that. We oftentimes have to take a step back and reassess and see, is God sitting there and saying, I'm going to bless whatever you choose, but do your homework. Make sure and assess which will lead you closer to me. Does one require you to move to a city where there are no churches? Is the other one going to lead you down a path where you'll be extremely indebted and you won't be able to get out of it? Uh, is this going to lead you to a path where you might have to step away from, you know, the services that usually anchor you down to me? Assess and see what are those impacts at the level of your finances, of your social status, at the level of your relationship with your family, at the level of your relationship with God. Once you assess all of these things and you're praying about them, you can then make a clear decision. And sometimes the best way to know God's will is to tell the Lord, Lord, what I'm asking for you is not for you to choose, but I'm asking you, Lord, to give me the grace and the discernment and the wisdom to be able to choose. And then you actually make your choice, Michael. Based on your assessment, you make your choice, and then you tell God, Lord, this is what I have chosen. Based on the gift of virtue, of discernment and wisdom and grace that you have given me, this is the choice that I have made, Lord. I place it before you. If this is something you are going to bless, then I ask you, Lord, please bless it abundantly. And if for any reason, Lord, for any unknown thing that I may not have considered, or even taking into consideration the future that you know and that I don't know, if you want to stop this, Lord, then again, I pray for your will and I will say amen. So in the process, Michael, what I urge you to do is in this conversation with your father of confession and all those people that you're involving in prayer, if you feel like it's time that a decision has to be made, make the decision. Ask God to give you the wisdom and the discernment. Go ahead and do it and then place it before God and say, Lord, based on everything you've placed on my heart, this is what I am at peace with and this is what I am moving forward with. And then from there, you do the best that you can. Right? So Michael, because I don't know the situation, obviously the situation might be a lot more dramatic than I'm making it out to be. It also might be a lot simpler. Um, so I would urge you, please, feel free to continue this conversation with your spiritual father. Uh, share with them what I have said. And if your father of confession tells you, no, like, we're not going to go that way. We're going to wait for a clear answer from God. Then consider that your father of confession knows absolutely best because he knows the details. Don't listen to a thing that I said. And if he does agree, then glory to God. You might have got an answer there. God bless you, Michael Habib. We have a lot more people who have joined. Thank you all for joining. Please feel free to submit your questions. We still have another about 10 minutes together. Uh, we have a question from Joseph that says, Dear Abuna, from the bottom of my heart, thank you for your mission. I might appreciate your Q&A lessons. May God bless it more and more. God bless you, Habib. Pray for us, please. My question is, in which name the baptism has to be done? Please compare Matthew 28, 19. And Acts 19.5, our Lord Jesus and the Father are one. 
Why did Jesus not answer his disciples answering regarding the end of days? Matthew 24, 36. So, Joseph Habib, I want to make sure I understand. When you say our Lord Jesus and the Father are one, uh, they are definitely one in essence. The Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit are definitely one in essence. And when we take a look at um, the Great Commission passages that we see in the Gospel of Mark and the Gospel of St. Matthew at the end of them, it is very clear the Lord sends them out and He says, Go and baptize them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. And so because of this, this is the formula that the church has kept for the longest time. We always baptize in the name of the All-Holy Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And this is why when we immerse into the waters, we always immerse three times. So the full immersion happens in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. That formula that we have received, exactly what we continue to do. So when you speak, uh, please compare Matthew 28, 19 and Acts 19, 15. I'll be happy to do that after the Q&A. You have to forgive me. I don't think our time allows for us to be able to compare the passages immediately uh, unless you want to share them and we can take a look, a quick look at them. But I hope that answers, Habibi. When it comes to baptism, everything that we do in the church, everything. When we do the crowning liturgy and people are married, they are married in the name of the All-Holy Trinity. When we participate in the Eucharistic prayers, we always pray in the name of the All-Holy Trinity. We always bless and say in the name of the Father and the Son, the Holy Spirit, one God, Amen. In the Coptic Rite, we say, Blessed be God, the Father, the Pantocrato. Blessed be His only begotten Son, our Lord Jesus Christ. Blessed be the Holy Spirit, the Paraclete. Everything is done in the name of the All-Holy Trinity. And so this is the tradition we have received. This is the tradition that we keep. I hope that answers Joseph Habib. Bento continues to ask and says, Does orthodoxy believe in universal salvation? The salvation guaranteed only who believe in Christ or all the entire world? Bento, we definitely believe what scripture says when it comes to unless a person comes through Christ, then he cannot go into, into, into the kingdom of heaven. Now this is very clearly what is written in um in the revelation of scripture that was handed down to us. And so we invite everyone to come to the knowledge of God through the Lord Jesus Christ. Now this does not mean that we hope for the that we don't hope for the salvation of the entire universe. You have to understand as Christians we are stuck in a very difficult dilemma. We want everyone to know who God is. We want them to know the beauty and the mystery of the incarnation. We want them to know the, 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 the son who has revealed himself by taking on the form of a man and who was crucified for, on our behalf, who rose from the dead on our behalf, who ascended into the heavens, who sent us the Holy Spirit that is there to dwell in us. We want them to know all of this. And so because of this, we truly want the entire world to be saved. And so we pray for the salvation of the world. But do we hope in it in the sense where we say, ah, don't even worry about it. You'll be perfectly fine. In the end, everyone is going to be saved. It doesn't matter if you've been good or bad. There's no difference between this person or that person. Everyone's getting in because God is nothing but like a, a loving father who's a doormat and everyone's going to step on him. No, we definitely don't preach this idea of everyone's getting in. You have nothing to worry about. And the concern, especially the pastoral concern of the church over the centuries has been that we know what will happen if the human being is told, you have nothing to worry about, you're getting in. The same way that if I take the simplest of examples, if, if I ask for an extension on handing in a paper in university, and because I haven't, I haven't done it yet and, I, and I've completely procrastinated, and it's two days away and I ask my teacher and he graciously tells me, fine, take another month before you hand it in. What am I gonna do? I'm gonna wait the week before it's due then, and I'm gonna waste these three weeks, and I'm going to try to get away with whatever I can get away with. The human being has it in them to not care because as long as they haven't crossed that line of failure, they think that they're good. The same way that you, if you ask any students how many people have already sat there and calculated how much do I need to pass, <laughs> this is exactly what we do. And this is why we still have questions within the faith of, you know, is it a sin if I? Well, it, it, the problem is that we're so penal in our approach. We're so legalistic that unfortunately... The human being has it in him to say, well, if everyone's getting in, then I got nothing to worry about. I'm going to live it up. I'm going to do what I want, whenever I want, to whoever I want. And in the end, I'll just say sorry and we'll be good. So we definitely don't preach universal salvation because we have no reason to believe in it because we don't really see that in Scripture. What we clearly see is all of these parables that talk about how it is that the good will be separated from the bad, that those who have believed in him will be saved that it, we come through him and we enter into the kingdom. Unless one eats the flesh and drinks the blood of the incarnate word of God, there is no life in him. He tells, um, he tells uh, Nicodemus, forgive me, I blank there, uh, that unless one is born of water and spirit, they can by no means enter into the kingdom of heaven. All of these things have led us to the consensus of we need to come, we need to offer ourselves to God, we need to declare the truth of the Holy Trinity, 
of the Christian reality. So for all of these reasons, we don't necessarily preach universal salvation. We do hope in it. We do hope that in God's abundant mercy, that somehow all of creation, all of humanity, created in His image and likeness, can somehow be redeemed. We don't know how He's going to do it, but we pray for it, because we would not want to see anybody created in God's image and likeness perish eternally. That being said, it's definitely not a dogma in the church, and orthodoxy does not believe in the universal salvation that some people believe in. Mona asks the following question, uh, Happy Feast, dear beloved Father, a blessed feast to you, Mona. Uh, is it okay if we have this live questions recorded so we can learn from it at other times? Uh, yes, actually what you'll notice Mona, is that as soon as we're done, uh, what we do is that we'll always extract this information and we'll place it on YouTube so you'll have access to it if you're subscribed to the channel. It'll always be uh, available to you afterwards. God bless you. We have two more questions and then we'll stop there. Uh, Raya says, Happy New Year, dear Abuna. Keep on recording these live videos. It's very beneficial. Thank you so much for your support, dear God. Bless you and pray for us. Joseph says, uh, Sorry, a short addition to my question. In Acts, it is described that Paul baptized in the name of Jesus, but Jesus ordered the baptism in the name of the All Holy Trinity. So, Joseph, thank you, Habib, for clarifying. Um, when Paul baptizes in the name of Jesus, what we're doing there in, the, in Scripture is the, making a distinction between the baptisms of repentance, the baptism of repentance that we saw from St. John the Baptist, right? And then there's the baptism that leads to life, which the Lord instituted Himself, which after His own theophany, the disciples began doing afterwards after Pentecost, after receiving the Holy Spirit. So in those passages, if you read the commentary of the church fathers, when we say he baptized in the name of Jesus, that's not necessarily to say, oh, we were there, we heard him, he didn't mention the Father or the Spirit. That's not necessarily what it translates into. What it translates into is that they were baptizing in what they had received from Jesus. So the same way that you'll notice in the book of Acts, how it is that, the Enoch that was found reading the Old Testament. And Philip, who appeared to him and told him, do you understand what you are reading? His response to him was, how can I unless someone explains it to me? And Philip here did not only simply stop to only explain to him the Old Testament passage. He continued to go all the way to explaining the arrival of the Lord Jesus Christ, who is the Messiah, who is the incarnate Word of God, in whom that if you believe in him, and, and when we say believe in Jesus, we're not just talking about believe that there was a historical person called Jesus. In Scripture, when it says, do you believe in Jesus? It means you believe in everything that He spoke, everything that He revealed, that He has a Father, and that Father is God, and that He will send the Paraclete, the Holy Spirit, the Helper, whom the, whom the Father will send in my name. That when we say, do you believe in Jesus, or baptized in the name of Jesus, it's in everything that encompasses the ministry and the teachings of Jesus. So again, Joseph Habiba, I hope that that clarifies just a little bit and by all means, if there was anything that was not clear, please feel free to refer back to the early church writings and the commentaries. Uh, they have been a great source of teaching and learning for me. Remember, uh, we're all students in this, my beloved. All of us who are participating in us. There is such a depth and a wealth to our faith. Our mother, the church, is so rich and wealthy. There's so much for us to uncover. So we urge you in the process of pursuing truth, continue asking your questions. Continue asking your questions to God in prayer. Continue invoking the Holy Spirit and asking the Holy Spirit that is within you to, to enlighten you, to lead you to the truth. Because the more you ask your questions, the more we receive them and are forced to study. And in the process, we become students of the truth. And we share with you what we have found. Everyone is benefiting. Please continue to pray for us. Please continue to share. Uh, any of the content of the Coptic Orthodox Answers Project with anybody that you feel can benefit. Our purpose is to bring glory to God and to, to, to really shed a light in a very dark world. And we're hoping to be able to touch as many people as we can for the sake of the glory of God. Uh, remember, we need your prayers. We need your support. Um, your prayers have been an incredible source of strength to us. Uh, we ask you to continue sending us your questions, encouraging us the way that you do. Uh, it's really wonderful. Pray for us, please. Share the content with anybody that you feel could benefit from it. And we'll see you, God willing, next month for another Q&A. To God be all glory now and forever, and unto the ages of all ages. Amen.